Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. Yes. And on behalf of Alice and myself, I want to greet you in the precious, wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. As we continue on in our study of the Sermon on the Mount, that being what normal Christianity is designed to be, the very words of Jesus Christ. Praise God. So, Father, we just thank you for this time that we have together. We thank you, Lord God for the gift of your word. Your word made flesh and dwelt among us, and your word which you've given us is an imperishable seed that brings us to you, and Lord, that causes us to be trained in righteousness. Lord, open the ears, open our ears that we would hear your voice during this time. Open the eyes of our heart, Lord God, that we would see wonderful things in your word. And Lord, put a guard over our mouth that I, that I say only what you would have me say. And I thank you for that, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we've been looking at last in our last session. We looked at we I'll say the last couple of sessions. We've been looking at Jesus saying that we, the disciples, the bond servants, mm -hmm. the remnant, we are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. All right, and that's kind of where we left off in our in our last program. Uh, and I want to continue on a little bit in that because we didn't quite finish that up. So we're going to start today in Matthew chapter 5, in verse 14, where Jesus said, You are the light of the world. But he also said there, A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Yes, he did. Okay. You know, Alice and I have, we've traveled Europe. Remember, we're getting ready to go back to Europe here in just a couple of weeks uh, to, to minister wherever and however the Lord leads. But I made the point that, like, if you go in Italy, mm -hmm. everywhere there's a hill, you're going to find a, a church a on feature. the top of it. Yeah. No. Maybe not for all the right reasons. But the fact of the matter is, because they're on a hill, and in the same way fortresses were always built on a hill, they're visible. Yes. And they have a, they have a presence that can't be denied. Because they're, no matter where you are, you always see them, right? Well, we're supposed to be that way. We're supposed to be visible to the world because we are the light of the world, right? And we're not supposed to be hidden. You know, it says in Matthew 5, 15, the next verse, he says, Nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. So, are we on a hill? Well, I don't know if you're thinking the natural, but if you're thinking the spiritual, you have to remember what Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus. When he said, even when we were dead in our transgressions, it made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated, seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Well, you can't get any higher than that. So God has lifted us up to be visible, right? And it's like he's saying, you certainly don't light a lamp. I mean, we have lamps here. You don't light a lamp and then put something over it to cover it. That, that makes no sense whatsoever. You don't want to dim it. No, you don't want to be dim-witted either. Because, you know, it's, it's, we were talking about the salt of the earth, and we were talking about in, in when he said, you know, that if salt has lost its flavor, if it's lost its taste, if it's lost its savor, as it says in the King James, it's worthless. Mm -hmm. But I explained in that study a couple of weeks ago that the Greek word that's used there is moraino, which literally is where we get our English word moron. So it would be moronic to light a light and then cover it up and hide it. What, I mean, how senseless would that be, right? You know, we live in a world that is absolutely filled with darkness and getting darker by the moment, it seems. Most right? definitely. Okay? Mm -hmm. It says in Isaiah chapter, in chapter 60, in verse 2, it says, For behold, darkness will cover the earth and deep darkness the people's. And I, I talked about this, deep darkness is like a fog, right? Yes. In darkness, it's one thing, because in darkness, like if you went into a football stadium and it was pitch black, night, night pitch black, not a light on, and a little candle somewhere, I mean, there could be 80,000 seats, but that one little candle, I promise you, every head would turn toward it. Absolutely, yes. It's amazing what a little light, and when it, the darker it is, that little light How will attract you. However, the deep darkness is like a fog. And if you've ever driven in fog and you turn your headlights on, that light just reflects right back at you. It doesn't penetrate. 
And I think we're coming to a time in the world where more and more the light of God, it's not penetrating. the light that he's using us, it's not penetrating. And that's that's why we're you know we're coming to the end of things. We're coming to the end of time. And in that time, you know, Amos prophesied, God spoke to Amos and said, you know, there'd be a famine, not a famine for bread, but a famine for the word. Yes. And it's not because the word's not there, it's just it's it's not being you know, it's like God says, My people perish for a lack of knowledge because they have rejected knowledge. So we need to let that light shine while it still can. Okay, and pray because that's pray without ceasing and be praying. You know, we need to be praying that people will respond, see that light, and it'd be like a lighthouse. It's such a beautiful song that was written uh, not, not terribly long ago called The Lighthouse, and a number of people have sung it. John Starnes, I think, is, is one of my favorites it, because it's like this is a lighthouse that sends out that light and keeps you from the rocks of destruction during the storms. And the storms are increasing. Yes, they are. So we want to be like that lighthouse, sending out a light. And it's not just to make it easier for things to see, but it's to, to point out where people should be going. Right? Because there's only one way they should be going. And Jesus Christ is that one way. That's right. The only way. And this, of course, is what offends so many people is the very simple fact that Jesus said, and you can't ignore this, John 14 and 6, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody, no man, comes to the Father but through me. You know, you, you can be very sincere and very religious, and you can go tramping around the world and looking for it to, you know, to meet up with Confucius under a tree, or find the Buddha sitting up on a mountain, or any other number of alternatives. But the simple fact of the matter is the only one who will lead you to God the Father is Jesus Christ. That is the Father's plan. Now, is that harsh? My goodness gracious, no. I mean, he wanted, he wanted us to know this. Jesus was publicly displayed when he was crucified. Hung on that cross, talk about being lifted up, hung on that cross and prayed, Father, forgive them. There's no excuse. There's, there's no excuse for rejecting Jesus Christ. You can't get to the Father on that day of judgment and say, well, you don't understand. Well, you, he does. He, understands. he knows everything. And there's no more that he could have done. There's nothing, by the way, there's no more he could have done no to more. open that door to the way to him. And there's nothing at all that you can do other than to receive that. I mean, you could go to church every single day, church building every single day. You could fast and pray every single day. You could offer bulls and calves and sheep. and You could do all those things. But the simple fact of the matter is that salvation, does it sound works. harsh? It's not by works. It is the free gift of God that no man might boast. Amen. It's a gift. You can't have it any easier than that. It's a very simple way. So that lighthouse that we are, that's what we should be pointing the way to. We should be pointing men towards Jesus Christ. And if we hide that light in these days, shame on us. Shame on us. All right? So Jesus is saying this is a daily thing. And it's not just a matter of going out and preaching. You know, we're not all called to preach. And I'll tell you, one of the dangers that I see today with Facebook and all the social media, uh, uh, all of a sudden everybody thinks they're teachers. But the Word of God says, let not many of you become teachers. For by this you incur a stricter judgment. Now, certainly you should be sharing the word. Certainly you should be proclaiming the excellencies of him, Jesus, who has called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Certainly, as long as it's still called today, you should be sharing words of encouragement. But the simple fact of the matter is not everybody's called to be a teacher. Okay? But we need to be out there and we need to be pointing people towards that way of salvation, pointing them towards Jesus Christ. So you don't have to be standing behind a pulpit. You don't have to have a television show or a radio show. You have to be living your life walking according to the Spirit. Doing all things as unto the Lord. We need, we need to know that when we were born, we were born with a stain. A stain, stain of sin. sin. And there's nothing that we can do to get rid of that. No. Nothing. Except receive the blood of Jesus. That's the glory of this. That's the glory of the gospel. Is that there's nothing that we can do, and there's nothing we have to do, because Jesus has done it all. He hung on that cross and said, "It is finished." 
All we have to do is receive that free gift. There's no other God can offer that. No. And I'll tell you what, no other God does offer that. That's right. I mean, every other God, it's just like, you got to do this, and you got to do this, you got to work to achieve it, you got to you got to buy it. No, no, no. It is the free gift of God, that any man should boast. You know, I, I, uh, I've been blessed to have the opportunity. I've been preaching this gospel for about 40 years, and over those 40 years, I have chosen, I have been led by the Spirit of God, to be self-supporting. Self-supporting in as much as I've, I've had jobs, I've run businesses, and I've been impressed by the fact, because I had been a, I had been a consultant before I got saved in New York City. I'd been, I'd, I'd done consulting work for some of the largest corporations in the world, for small businesses, and business was kind of my passion. But I found out when I got saved that everything that I knew that was good in business, done right, is in the Word of God. Now you think, oh, wait a minute, this is a religion book. No, it's not a religion book. It's a life book. Yes. You know, so Peter said, Manufacturer's handbook. handbook. Peter said that God has given us everything pertaining to life and godliness. Yes. Not just godliness, but to life and godliness. Mm -hmm. I promise you there is instruction for how do you to perform at work. Yes. And one of the things you should know about performing at work is that we have what's called in England a royal warrant. Now, royal warrant is really a cool thing because this is for the elite of merchants and people that provide service and products who can provide them to the royal house. Because if they are selected to do that, they receive what is called a royal warrant. And you'll see on their letterhead, on their doors, on, on their stationer, it'll say, by appointment to Her Majesty the, the, the Queen. You know, we, we make shoes or we make paper, we do whatever, but we do it by appointment to Her Majesty the well, you know what? That's nice. But you have a royal warrant from the King of Kings. Because you are to do everything that you do. Whether you're a plumber, a, a baker, a candlestick maker, carpenter. carpenter, whatever you do, you're to do it as unto the Lord. You have a warrant to do it as to, for, the King of Kings. Yes. That's better than the Queen of England. No offense, honey. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's why Matthew, in Matthew... Jesus went on to say, Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Now, this is truly an important thing. You are to do good works. You are. There, there is a social gospel. There is an everything gospel, okay? Pertaining to life and godliness. Well, that's one of the changes that happens in us when we're born again. Yes. I mean, it's something that you want to do. You should want to do it yeah. because the love of God That's has been poured into your heart through the Holy Spirit. And that love is not, you know, I love Alice. Mm -hmm. A bitch. Okay. But I, I, I am called, as Alice is, to have the love of God for everybody. Yes. Saint and sinner alike. Mm -hmm. Friend and foe alike. Right. You know, it's not our job as, as ambassadors for Christ as a people who have a ministry of reconciliation, it's not to fight off the evildoers. Now, there is a ministry to do that, mm -hmm. but that, that ministry has been given to governments mm -hmm. who have been given the sword to protect us from evildoers. It is not our ministry. Our ministry is to bring the good news of Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world, to bring the light of God into this world of darkness. That's our ministry. So... We have to let that light shine. Whatever we do, like I said, if you're a butcher, a baker, a candlestick maker, whatever you do, you have to do it in a way that people see God's light in you. Mm -hmm. And you want to know something? They can. They can. They'll see something different in you. It's not hard to see today so many people who are so off at work. Mm -hmm. They're unhappy, mm -hmm. they're mm -hmm. miserable, yeah. so they're grumbling and complaining. Mm -hmm. You know, it says in the Word that we're not to grumble or complain. It says that we are to give thanks in all things, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. It says that whatever so we do, as I said, we were to do it as unto the Lord. If you do that, people will notice a difference in you. It'll be a different attitude. Yes, because God has made a difference in your life. You know, I've shared this a number of times. Way back when, in the 70s, when I got saved, and I was going to a seminary, doing graduate work in a seminary in New York, I also got a job in a boatyard. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I, at the time I got saved, 
I owned a small full service advertising agency. And I had been in quote unquote executive positions or, you know, as you say, I was a management consultant or a consultant in New York City. Now all of a sudden, I am out and I am doing hard physical labor in a boatyard on the Hudson River just outside of New York City. And the fellow that I worked for, an old Italian fellow, didn't like me. Now I'm sure you're saying, how can that be? <laughs> Well, the fact was, I don't think I don't think it was me personally, but he didn't like the Jesus in me, and he didn't. I mean, it, for for whatever reason, and I never, I don't know the reason to this day, why it upset him so. That I just lived my life for Christ, and I was filled with joy. I was filled, This is the fruit of the Holy Spirit: the love, the peace, the joy. So this guy, and he was much older than I, would give me all of the rottenest, dirtiest job in this boatyard. And I mean, it was like it was like he was trying to get me to fail, trying to get me to fall, trying to get me set. to to yeah. lose that fruit, right? Yes. Yeah. And by the grace of God, I just didn't because you know I just had by the grace of God. Yeah, that's the fruit that works. So it was a boatyard, where a private boatyard. You know, people own the boats, little yachts, and so forth. And one day, three fellows came up to me. They were boat owners in this boatyard. And they said, they, they cornered me, you know, and they said, why don't you just punch this guy in the nose? <laughs> because they saw him doing this to me. I mean, just, like I said, every dirty job came up when I was the guy. And I said, it's because of the love of Jesus. I said, that's why. I said, I have a peace that passes understanding. I have a love, even for people that, that are harsh to me. So I got to share the gospel with them. And I think it was either two or three of them that they accepted the Lord Jesus. Now, Watch this now. God's light was shining through me. Yes, yes. But God got the glory. Yes, he did. I wouldn't take the glory. I didn't deserve the glory. Because I promise you, knowing me before I got saved, I could not have done this on my own. I would not have done this on my own. On my own, I would have punched the guy in the nose. <laughs> but by the grace of God. So God was glorified in this. And I promise you that if you do these things, if you do things as unto the Lord by the grace of God, by the power of God, by the strength of God, not by power nor by might, but by my spirit, saith the Lord, if you do that, people will see the difference and they will know and they will want to know why. Because they can't do it. That's right. You cannot do this in this day and age without the power of the Holy Spirit in you. That's, right. That's a fact. You know, there was, a, there was a fellow that Alice and I met um, back, I think, in 77. His name was Harold Hill. And Harold Hill, he was an engineer, very, very knowledgeable man, a very successful, very successful businessman. And he wrote a number of books. But the one book that I think touched probably more lives than ours was called How to Live Like a King's Kid. Yes. And all it was was a little short, a, a book of little short That's testimonies nice. of things that he had done. How I say that he had done that God had done in him, for him, and through him. That's right. And the thing that stuck out to me most of all, and I know this is true with Alice, yes. that he talked about when something would go wrong, and you want to know something? Something always, always goes wrong. Many of the tribulations of the righteous, something always goes wrong. That's a fact. Yes. But he would say, and this is, this is his point, this is what he had come to. This was when, his attitude. His attitude. Yeah. When something went wrong, he, said, he would say, what's in this for you, Lord? Now, the chances are good that you all know this verse, that Paul wrote one of the most glorious chapters in the Bible, Romans chapter 8. And he said, for we know, he said, we know, yes, we know, that all things, God causes all things to work together for good for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. So now, so many Christians think, well, this is really great. You know, it's all about, i got to find my goodness. God's going to cause it to work for good. I gotta... No, you don't. Because if you know that whatever is going on in your life is going to work for your good, then you can follow his other instruction here in the Sermon on the Mount. He answers nothing. Don't worry about tomorrow. Right. Just put it out of your head because you know it's covered. Just keep on. You don't have to cover it because you're not able to. But our God, to whom nothing is impossible, he's got it covered and he's made a promise and he watches over his word to perform it. He will make it work for your good. So that should set you free from that thing that seems to be giving you trouble now. It sets you free. And now you can say, what's in this for you, Lord? 
Because what's really important is not your good, or may seem important to you, but what is really important is God's glory. So whatever is going on in your life, whatever seems so terrible, think of it as a, you know, see the, as an opportunity for God to be glorified. Be looking. Be and watching, be, be looking. Yeah. Don't be looking for how he's going to save you. Be looking for how he's going to glorify himself. And I promise you, your life will change. Yes. It'll be an adventure. I, I, it'll be an adventure. Now, those of you who know me have probably heard me say many times, because, you know, I've given my testimony. I've had, a, I've had an adventure or two. Uh, and, and I say to people, you know, I mean, I don't want to go through the whole list now. I'll go through a little bit of the list. I was almost, I almost wasn't born. The doctors wanted to abort me. And this is in 1943. That's right, get your calculator. 1943, when they didn't do abortions. But the doctor said to my, my mother and father that if I were to be born, if she gave birth to me, it would kill her. So they wanted to abort. My father took her to a different hospital, different doctors. She survived, and I guess you can see that I have to. Hallelujah. I had polio when I was eight years old, in a time when there was a great epidemic in the United States. And instead of, I was in a, I was in a ward, in a hospital with so many children, and so, so many were in iron lungs, and so many did not survive that. And I think the doctor said to my parents, you know, if he, if he walks again, if he lives, he'll probably never walk again. Well, I, if I weren't on the camera, I'd get up and dance for you. I've been on a plane flying in the Navy that had an explosion on board. I've, I, I can't even think of it. I've been on a ship caught in a hurricane when everybody despaired of life. I know what it means in Psalm 107. Big ship. Yeah. yeah. Um, I've been hit by a speeding semi truck when I was on foot down in Central America when we lived there as missionaries. And I say to people, you know, does it sound like I've had a few adventures in my life? And everybody's, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I said, well, if, that, if those things happened to you, would you call them adventures? Or would you call them problems? Problems are no fun. No. Nobody and, wants and, problems. And, and nobody wants problems. And particularly, nobody wants your problems. <laughs> That's here. You, know, you know, it says misery loves company. But I'll tell you what, the company doesn't love your misery. You know, but adventures. Hallelujah. Adventures. Everybody wants to hear about because adventures. Because everybody wants to hear yeah. about adventures. Otherwise, they wouldn't be making movies. That's right. But the fact of the matter is, adventures are where the victory lies. That's right. That's right. The only difference between a problem and an adventure is your attitude. And if your attitude is, I know God's going to work this for good. What's in this for you, Lord? Be glorified. Your life will change. I promise you that right now, right there. And God will shine his light in your life. And people will be drawn to that light that they might come to him, not to you. Yes. This is not about you. It is all about him. All about it's unfortunate today with so much you turn on Christian television or radio and, so, and, and all you're hearing is this person's name and that person's name. You know what? John the Baptist had the right attitude. Jesus said in Matthew 11 that nobody had a greater ministry than John the Baptist at that time. What was his ministry? To prepare the way for the Lord, call people to repentance. But he said, he, Jesus, must increase, but I must decrease. That needs to be our attitude. And that is so contrary to our human nature. Absolutely. Because our human nature is filled with pride. Selfie. It's about, right. It's a, yeah, we live in a time of selfies like never before. And by the way, you know, that's what Paul wrote to Timothy, talking about the perilous last days. The very first thing he said was, men will be lovers of self. That's right. Now, in some of the sillier new translations, that should be, uh, men will be lovers of selfies. But the fact is, we need to be lovers of God. Hallelujah. That's what we need to be, lovers of God. By the way, I don't know if that book is still around, How to Live Like a King's Kid by Harold Hill. should get it. But if it is... Look it up, and it's, it's, I promise you it's, it's worth your time to read. Uh, <laughs> commercial time. If you don't like that one, I'm, I'm in the process of getting ready to publish a book called Sweet Wine in the Morning, right? Yes. Which is a little book of testimonies that Alice and I have experienced over the last 40 years. And again, it's not about me. It's about the things, you know, it's, it's about the things that God has done in and through my life. And if that sounds silly, if you don't believe me, I promise you, go, go get it when it comes out shortly. Because the fact is, 
most of my little testimonies don't show what a great faith hero I am. They show what a dummy I am and how glorified God got by, by rescuing me. Okay? It's not to bring glory to me. It's about the God whom I serve. And I serve him. Hallelujah. Thank you. Okay, we're going to get into something now that we're not going to be able to finish for sure. Because Jesus continued in the Sermon on the Mount and he said, in verse 17, I'm going to read verse 17 first. It says, Do not think that I came to abolish the law of the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. <clears throat> a lot of people, a lot of Christians today, think that the law is chewing out the window and no good. Not so. Not so. Not so. And I want to tell you that we're still today, in spite of the fact we say we're not under law, we are so often judged by our new law, by our traditions. So people will look at you and see, you know, are you following this tradition or that tradition? Like they did Jesus. And exactly like they did with Jesus. If you read John chapter 9, the account of the man who had been born blind, that Jesus heals, sends to the pool of Siloam, right? He comes back. You, you will see something interesting because the Pharisees at that time said, Speaking of Jesus, they said, we know this man is a sinner. How did they, the Pharisees, how did they know? And they're, they're, they're being, listen, these are hypocrites and everything, whitewashed tombs. But they were utterly convinced that Jesus was a sinner. You know why? Because they thought that he has, was not fulfilling, or not doing the law. Jesus never broke the law. He fulfilled the law. They had come to live on traditions built around the law. And that's still so true. It's so true in the Jewish religion, but I want to tell you something. It's so true in so much of Christianity that we are judged by the traditions we hold instead of by the Word. But the fact is, Jesus said, on that day, on that day of judgment, there's one thing that will judge you. The words which I have spoken is what he said. So we're going to get into this because certainly nobody that ever lived spoke more on this topic than the Apostle Paul. One who had been a Pharisee among the Pharisees. A scholar of the law, right? And he was the one that said, you know what? You are not saved by law. And over and over and over he talks about it is not the law that gives you a right relationship with God the Father. Over and over and over. However, we're going to get into this because it's so important I'm just going to read you a couple of things, and we're going to go into this in depth in our next one. Paul said, I'm going to read from Romans 7. Just jump in. And he said, but now we have been released from the law, having died to that which by, by which we were bound, so that we serve in the newness of the Spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. We're going to get into this and see how Paul totally agrees with Jesus. That the law is not bad, it's not good, not evil. He says it is good and holy. So we'll go into that next in our next program. And Father, we thank you for this time. And we thank you for your word. We thank you for the law and the prophets. We thank you for every good gift that you've given us. But Father, above all, we thank you for the gift of your son, Christ Jesus, who did for us what we could never do for ourselves, to shed that blood that redeemed us from the curse of sin, redeemed us from the curse of the law, that we might have a right relationship with you. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name. Well, till next time, God bless you and goodbye. So I cherish that old rugged cross till my trophies at last.